This is the first of two lectures about classification. What we're going to be talking about today are two examples of classification algorithms, logistic regression and naive Bayes. But before we get into them, let's first begin with a discussion about the classification problem in general. For the classification problem, you're given a universe, X, from which your examples can come. This universe might be, for example, all English documents with some predefined vocabulary. Your examples are represented in this space. So for example, each document has some subset of the vocabulary. We'll see more about this in a second. In addition to this universe of examples, you also have a set of classes. This is your objective. For example, you want to label each document as either being about spam or not. Following literature, we'll call non-spam documents ham. Typically, the way that these algorithms are learned is that you start with some training set of documents, with each document coming from the universe and being labeled with one of the classes. The goal is to produce some algorithm that can map examples from X into the set of classes. We will call this classifier gamma. Classification is used for many problems. And even if you restrict yourself to news articles, for example, there are many possible classifiers that you could define to distinguish documents. For example, you might distinguish documents in terms of the region being discussed, in terms of the industries being discussed, or in terms of the subject areas or topics being discussed. Given each of these training sets, you would get a different classifier. Classifiers have been used for many applications. For example, with Google Alerts, you can set up a standard query and have Google email you every time that query appears. We can also use classifiers to distinguish what language is being used in a document. As I talked about in the first lecture, every email you read has been examined by a classifier to determine whether it's spam or ham. Major search engines also use classifiers to determine whether images are family safe or not. One very hot field where classification is being used quite a bit is sentiment analysis. Companies want to know what people are saying about their products online. You can train a classifier to determine whether people are talking about a product or service positively or negatively. Because it's impossible for a human being to read everything that someone is saying about a particular car, for example, online, this gives a very quick way for companies to figure out whether people like or dislike their product. Classification is also part of e-commerce. You can use a classifier to determine whether a user would like a particular kind of product or not. At first, classification was mostly a manual task. Humans can do a very good job of classifying documents. Entire academic subdisciplines have been developed around classification of documents by humans. This can result in very high quality classification schemes when you're not having to deal with thousands of documents every second. But manual annotation does not scale, and it's very, very expensive. To do it well, you simply need automatic methods for classification. After manual classification proved to be untenable, the next approach that people used was using rule-based classification. This can be in the form of Boolean queries, regular expressions, 
or very complicated logical expressions. However, the creation of these rules is very expensive too, and they can be quite brittle. If your data are changing, you constantly need to refine and adapt your rules in order to capture the underlying content. The current state of the art and the current best practice is to use statistical and probabilistic methods to do classification. We'll be spending the next two classes talking about these techniques, naive Bayes, logistic regression, support vector machines, and decision trees. While these methods are quite effective, they still do require a large amount of training data. You need many examples of documents labeled with your classes. But fortunately, in contrast to the building of rule-based classifiers, this classification can often be done by non-experts. For example, all of the users of a web email system labeling whether a particular email is spam or not. Let's take a look at the first example of a classifier, logistic regression. The goal of logistic regression is, given an observation x, compute the probability of a label y, so the probability of y given x. Logistic regression is very similar to another technique that we'll see later called naive Bayes that uses Bayes' rule to compute this conditional probability. However, logistic regression calculates this quantity directly using something that looks a lot like the linear regression that we talked about last week. This is called logistic regression because of a special mathematical function that it uses to make sure that its predictions are truly probabilities, the probability of y given x. It's regression because the input to this special logistic function is essentially a regression. You have features that you multiply by coefficients, just like we saw in linear regression. Logistic regression is also an example of a general family of probabilistic modeling techniques called maximum entropy models. For those of you who took computational linguistics with me last semester, you will have heard a lot about that. If you're interested in this, particularly in its application to text-based applications, consider taking computational linguistics when it's offered next fall. And as we'll see later today, we can also see that naive Bayes is a special example of logistic regression. Mathematically, there are two components that define a logistic regression model. You have your data x, and then you have your coefficients beta. So assume that you have two classes that you're trying to distinguish, y equals 0 or y equals 1. You can think about this as spam or not spam. Given some data x, you need to provide a probability that it is in the class or not. Equations 1 and 2 give formulas for combining betas and the x's to produce a probability. The term in the x function should remind you of a regression. This 1 over 1 plus x function will be used a lot, so we'll use the symbol sigma as shorthand for it. This function is called the logistic function. This is what gives logistic regression its name. In case it's been a while since you've seen the exponential function, it is the inverse of the logarithmic function. So remember, a logarithm makes big things small, an exponential function makes small things big. You may remember it as part of the formula for computing continuously compounding interest. The logistic function is just 1 over 1 plus the exponential function. If you plot this function, it looks like an S. 
The nice thing about this is that the output of this function is always between 0 and 1. This allows us to model probabilities. So recall that the output of a linear regression can be any real number. However, however, the output from a logistic regression must be between 0 and 1 because it's a probability. This is the main distinction between logistic and linear regression. Now that we've defined logistic regression, let's see an example. So let's say that we've defined our logistic regression coefficients as follows. Every word in our vocabulary gets a coefficient, as does the bias vector. This should remind you of the intercept from linear regression. Here we're trying to classify between spam and not spam documents. When y equals 1, that means that the document is spam. We want to calculate for each document the probability that it is not spam and that it is spam. So if we have an empty document, how do we compute that? In that case, the only term inside the exp function is the bias term. So we plug in the bias term for both probability of y equals 0 and the probability of y equals 1, and then we get 0.48 and 0.52. So you can think about the bias term as encoding the prior probability of each of your classes. The bigger this bias term is, the more likely on average we believe that we will see a spam document, even without seeing any words. Okay. That's an empty document. Let's compute the probabilities for a document with two words. So let's say that we have the words mother and Nigeria in the document. So now when we plug this in, we have 0.1. That's the bias term. It will always be there. Then we add in negative 1 for mother, and then we add in 3 for Nigeria. When we compute these values, we get 0.13 for the probability of it being a not spam email and probability 0.87 that it is a spam email. Now let's take a look at a more complicated example. Let's say you have a document with the words mother, work, Viagra, and again the word mother. You first start with the bias value, 0.1, and then you add in minus 1 for mother, minus 0.5 for work, plus 2 for Viagra, and then minus 1 again for mother. If you have multiple appearances of a word or feature, you multiply the coefficient for that word or feature by the number of times you see it. So plugging these into the equation, we get the probability of it being spam of 0.3 and the probability of it not being spam 0.6. Thus far, the way that we've presented logistic regression, given a set of coefficients, you know how to compute the conditional likelihood, probability of y given some observed data and those coefficients. What we haven't talked about is how to find the values of those weights beta. The details are somewhat mathematically hairy. It requires you to take derivatives and gradients and then use gradient descent to find the optimal values of beta that maximize the conditional likelihood. But hopefully, through the examples I, I've just done and the examples that we'll do in class, you'll see that the intuition is that higher weights mean that this feature is more important uh, for this class. And what we'll talk about next is naive Bayes, which can be seen as a special case of logistic regression that uses Bayes rules and conditional probabilities to set the coefficients beta. Before we apply naive Bayes to real data, let's start with a simple example, coin flips. 
Suppose that you have two coins, C1 and C2. They're unfair coins. Suppose I pull a coin out of my pocket, I flip it a bunch of times, record the coin and outcomes, and repeat this for a number of times. This sequence of coin flips represents your training data. Now suppose that you're given a new sequence, 0, 0, 1, which coin is it more likely from? The problem of determining which coin generated a sequence of coin flips has some interesting challenges. There are a different number of covariates for each observation, and the number of covariates can be large. However, you can get some structure out of this. It's easy to get the probability of drawing a particular coin out of your pocket. We can estimate that directly from the data. Four out of the seven coins were coin one, and three out of the seven coins were coin two. It's also easy to get the conditional probability of a head given a particular coin. For example, for coin one, the probability of heads is 12 16th, and for coin two, the probability of a heads is 6 18th. And by conditional independence, we can decompose the probability of a sequence of outcomes into the individual conditional probabilities. So can we use these facts to get the probability of a coin given an observation? Yes, we can. And the way that we can do this is by applying Bayes' rule. So the probability of a class given data decomposes into the probability of data given a class times the probability of the class divided by the data. We need to estimate the probability of data given a class and the probability of a class for each of the classes. We don't need to compute the denominator because that will be the same for all classes. Now this works really well for Bayes' rule because by definition the outcomes of coin flips are truly independent given the coin. But for other kinds of data, it's more complicated. If you want to identify the type of fruit given a set of features, such as color, shape, and size, this becomes more complicated because these features are not independent. If you have a fruit that's long and skinny, it's more likely to be yellow. Similarly for apples, if the apple is small, it's more likely to be green. This makes computing the conditional probabilities very difficult. There are many combinations of each of the features for each of the fruit. The idea behind naive Bayes is that we're going to assume that all of the features are independent given the class. So in the case of the fruit example, we'll assume that the probability of a fruit being green only depends on whether it is an apple and is independent of all of the other features. We make this assumption for all of the features for every class. Now that we've gone through the intuition behind naive Bayes, let's define this a little bit more rigorously using mathematical notation. Naive Bayes is a probabilistic classifier, and we compute the probability of a document being in class C as follows. The probability of a class given a document is proportional to the probability of the class times the product of the conditional probabilities of all of the features given that class. This equation is the defining equation of naive Bayes. Notice that we do not have the marginal probability of all of the classes in the denominator like we did a couple of slides ago. This is because this is the same for each of the classes. Thus, we have replaced the equal sign with proportional to. Because this is so important, let's go through each of these terms. In D is the length of the document, the number of tokens. 
probability of word I given class C is the conditional probability of a term occurring in a document of class C. This should remind you of the coefficients for logistic regression. It's a measure of how much evidence that particular feature contributes to the decision that C is the correct class. And the probability of C is the prior probability of C. So before you see any data, how likely do you think class C is? So if the evidence or the terms don't provide clear evidence for one class or another, you choose the class with the higher prior probability. This should remind you of the bias term in logistic regression. Our goal is to find the best class. So we find the class that gives us the higher score for the naive Bayes formula. Often we will write these probabilities with a hat because we need to estimate these values from the training set. That's what we'll be talking about next. So how do we estimate probability distributions? Suppose that you want to estimate the probability of the word by appearing in the spam category. What you do is you look at your training data, which has a bunch of words, and you look at the documents that were labeled spam. You collect all of those words and then look at the proportion of how many words were by in the spam category. The maximum likelihood estimate of this is just the proportion of the words that were by over all of the words. So this likely seems reasonable, but let's consider the probability of another word, the probability of the word bagel given spam. If there were no occurrences of the word bagel in documents labeled spam, you'd get a zero estimate. And then, if you wanted to compute the probability of spam for any document that contained the word bagel, you would get the answer zero. So obviously this is bad, because then any spammer could put the word bagel in their email, and then it would get through the spam filters. Thus, zero probabilities can't be conditioned away. When we work with Bayesian formulations, as is often the case in computational linguistics, oftentimes we have what's called a prior. We have some idea of what our data are going to look like. For example, they're going to be non-zero, they're going to be sparse. Uh, we assume that all else being equal, they'll, they'll basically look like a uniform distribution. And this gives us an alternative to the maximum likelihood distribution uh, what's called the maximum a posteriori estimate. You combine your likelihood f with some prior g. For multinomial distributions, like that over words, we can assume that we have a term alpha that we add to all of our observed counts. This is called a smoothing factor or a pseudo count and when alpha is 1 for all observations, this is called Laplace smoothing and corresponds to a uniform prior over all possible distributions over words. In this class, we'll typically assume Laplace smoothing, although other values of alpha may work better for particular applications. And if you want to know more about this, this is actually a new kind of probability distribution called a Dirichlet distribution over all distributions over words. And it has this nice property called conjugacy that allows you to have these closed form maximum a posteriori estimates. I mention this just for the sake of completeness. Uh, this is something that, that I do a little bit of research on, so if you want to find out more about it, feel free to talk to me about it or, or ask questions, but you don't need to know it for this class. So that's how you estimate probability distributions given observations, and we'll go through examples in class.
Now that we've estimated these probability distributions, we can plug these into the naive Bayes equation. And this works well because we can estimate these univariate distributions much more easily than estimating multivariate distributions. Recall that the naive Bayes equation has a bunch of multiplications in it. And the things that we're multiplying are probabilities. These probabilities tend to be fairly small numbers. When you multiply a lot of small numbers together, this results in even smaller numbers that sometimes can't be represented effectively on a computer. This problem is called underflow. Remember when we talked about logarithms a couple classes ago? One of the nice properties of logarithms is that if you have the log of x times y, that is equal to the logarithm of x plus the logarithm of y. So this means that we can sum log probabilities instead of multiplying probabilities. And because logarithms are a monotonic function, the class with the highest score doesn't change. So when in practice you actually implement naive Bayes, typically what you do is instead of computing the probability of a class by taking the product, you actually take the sum of log probabilities. So you take the log probability of the overall prevalence of a class, and then for each of the features or words that you've observed, you sum all of the log probabilities together. This should remind you of logistic regression. This looks a lot like the same function that we use. We have the bias term, and then for each of the features, we add in each of the terms. In class, we'll spend some time working through examples of this, hopefully drawing the connection between logistic regression and naive Bayes. To wrap up, we've seen both naive Bayes and logistic regression. Logistic regression gives you a formula for calculating conditional probabilities given coefficients beta. Naive Bayes gives you probabilities for a class computed using Bayes' rule. And in fact, they're actually mathematically equivalent if you set the coefficients of logistic regression in a very particular way. You don't need to know the details of this slide. I present this here in case you're curious. So now that we've talked about both naive Bayes and logistic regression, let's contrast them. Naive Bayes is typically easier to do. As we showed here, it's fairly straightforward to compute the conditional probabilities. And in fact, naive Bayes works better on small data sets. Logistic regression tends to work better on medium-sized data sets. And on really large data sets, it really doesn't matter. You have enough data to estimate these parameters efficiently in both cases, and they both do about the same. The optional reading I have on the web page by Andrew Ng and Michael Jordan has proofs uh, and experiments go into a bit more detail on this. One of the bonuses of logistic regression is that it allows arbitrary features. And this is why naive Bayes is not in rattle. However, I, I think it's a useful conceptual tool to understand how data can generate feature coefficients for models like naive Bayes and logistic regression. So I think it's important to go over just as a conceptual foundation that helps you understand things like logistic regression better. And again, you don't need to memorize or work through the previous slide. Just understand that naive Bayes is a special case of logistic regression, which we'll work through examples of in class. Now next time, we'll talk about classification some more. We'll talk about state-of-the-art models such as support vector machine and interpretable models like decision trees.